This podcast contains lots of swearing and violence, occasional use of the N-word, and other content that some people may find disturbing or offensive. He was an Ethiopian immigrant. He'd come here, and I guess he was a college student. You know, I don't know him personally at all, but I, I mean, that's just an innocent person, you know, who came here for school and a better life, and these guys killed him. The crime took place here on Southeast 31st, early Sunday morning. Three black men, all from Ethiopia, were sitting in this car talking. When one left to head for his apartment, another car pulled up. Three young white men jumped out and began beating him. There were also two women with the three skinheads, women who stayed in their car, but who shouted encouragement. They never say anything. Just the girls, they screaming inside, and they say, kill, you know, kill him or beat him, you know. Dead is 27-year-old Mulageta Sarau. We're all hanging out at this apartment on 21st Street. There was like 20 of us. Someone brought the news that um, they'd killed somebody, that the, those people that we'd been fighting, and it was like this silence. We were all like, oh my God, this is, this is real. Shit, this is real. We knew that it was, but having someone killed like that, I mean, and it was like a sadness and kind of like we realized that what we'd actually been fighting was something that we totally needed to fight. The murder of Mulagata Sarah hit the city hard. Even today, many Portlanders remember the moment when they first heard the news. People who lived in the Kearns neighborhood, site of the murder, were shocked to learn of their racist neighbors. This was not shocking to black and queer Portlanders, indigenous people, immigrants, and punks, all targets of the young neo-Nazi gangs. City leaders could no longer gaslight frightened teens or marginalized populations. It was the beginning of a civic defense that would forever change Portland. Welcome to episode two of It Did Happen Here, the murder of Mulugeta Sarah. I'm Mike Crenshaw, your host for this episode. A young man named Mulugeta Sarah, who was an Ethiopian student at Portland State University, was beaten to death by neo-Nazi skinheads on the streets of Southeast Portland. That's Scott Nakagawa, an activist and organizer. We'll be hearing from him a lot throughout this podcast. Those uh, neo-Nazi activists were affiliated with a group called Eastside White Pride, and they in turn were um, affiliated with a national organization called the White Aryan Resistance, which was led by a man named Tom Metzger, who was a former Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, and many suspected a member of an underground neo-Nazi group called the Order that was involved in a number of famous murders and millions of dollars of burglaries, of um, mainly of uh, armored cars. We understood this group was very dangerous. Um, a couple of their members... Um, were surprised people in the community. One was the leader of a popular Portland band. He was a big cultural figure in the alternative music scene here, um, who was known by the name Ken Death. He actually was the star of a short film by the filmmaker Gus Van Zandt called Ken Death Gets Out of Jail. So, you know, I had some familiarity with Ken and the circle that he moved in. So that was a bit of a surprise, though not as much as the surprise that Carl Brewster presented us. Carl Brewster, who was from an upper middle class family and whose mother was a progressive social activist of us in the city. So, you know, these things that defied stereotypes, these young men who brutally, really brutally beat uh, Mulugeta Sura to death with baseball bats and by kicking him, and for nothing, for some dispute over parking or something, shocked the city. Shocked the city that these were not your stereotypical street thugs, that they were highly sophisticated political thinkers, that they had national affiliations, and that they, you know, specifically were who they were. The news of the murder deeply impacted the punk community. We bring back punks Joran and China from the last episode to share their experiences. They had moved from just being bullies of our scene to political actors that were capable of murder. They meant business. And I think it mobilized a lot of us to start being a little less passive and we needed to do something. There were some people that were sent up here. I feel like Tom Metzger sent them. They were like white Aryan nations or whatever. They sent up here and they had hits out on a couple of us. And so there were like street fights. And I remember there was a concert. A bunch of us were there. And then these Nazis showed up and they even had tasers. It was nuts. 
Portland's power base, political, economic, uh, educational, they did not respond well or quickly enough to skinheads. That's Ron Herndon, one of the most well-known activists in Portland. Ron Herndon had been a student radical at Reed College and later founded Portland's chapter of the Black United Front. Herndon had decades of experience in organizing in Portland's tightly knit black community, particularly around issues of race equity in Portland schools throughout the 1980s. It's, it's almost as if you see that you've got a cut on your hand and it's not healing well and you ignore it. And then you wonder why you've got poison streaming throughout your arm and then now it's spreading throughout your body. Mm. Something should have been done when you saw the cut. And when this organization of those who espouse that racist dogma, when it first came to town, they putting out their little flyers and hate group, hate statements, there should have been a far more assertive response to that then. And I think that's the danger that when this pops up, and it's quite cyclical, when it pops up, that there has to be an immediate strong response from every possible a segment of society to it. And if we ignore that, we ignore it at our own peril. Again, here's Scott Nakagawa. The racist right in the United States is a permanent feature of American politics and requires constant vigilance. So that was something we learned, and we learned very quickly. We learned how long the history was of many of the white nationalist groups that were active here in Oregon. We learned about the influence of groups like the Posse Comitatus here in Oregon that goes back decades. The Posse Comitatus, whose ideology was um, basically, is basically a blueprint for the Bundy uprising and the occupation of the bird sanctuary in Mulher County. These kinds of groups and ideas have always been a part of the political mix, have always been limiting our democratic potential here, have always targeted communities of color, women, um, religious minorities, and have always been able to play a really significant role in determining what political outcomes we will have here in Oregon, all the way around the country. We. Um, in studying that history, also saw, for example, that the Ku Klux Klan was very active here in the 1920s. That at one point, I believe it's true, that about one in three white men in the city of Portland belonged to the Ku Klux Klan. The Ku Klux Klan here played the kingmaker in one Oregon election, helping to decide who the governor would be. And were really um, active in trying to close down Catholic parochial schools. Their influence is something we still feel here. Um, you know, one of the reasons why we have such a robust public school system here in Oregon relative to many other places is because of the activity of the Klan. Part of the reason why we have such a powerful free speech clause in our constitution is in part the influence of the Ku Klux Klan. And so, you know, they are part and parcel of the story of Oregon. They are part of the history here. And so we should never behave as if because they become less visible, they've gone away. In fact, they've always been here. Racism has extremely deep roots in Oregon. Uprooting white supremacy requires long-term strategizing and relationship building to create community and coalition locally, nationally, and internationally. Black Portland had been building these kinds of coalitions for decades. Here's Ron Herndon again describing the community events supporting African liberation struggles. During the uh, late 60s, all during the 70s, every year, there was a, a big march and rally here in Portland called African Liberation Day. And it was to support African countries who at that time were still suffering from colonialism and apartheid. And that event every year was meant to bring attention to that, give support to the liberation movements. Black people here in Portland who sent uh, supplies, clothes back to those countries. The communities were, were intertwined. There were efforts made between members of both communities to learn from each other, to support each other, celebrate and work with each other, invited people to, to their various events, holiday celebrations. So I think that's why it made it very easy for the Ethiopian community to reach out to us. Uh, I remember getting a phone call the day after he had been murdered and someone from the Ethiopian community that I knew said that we need we need help we don't know what to do uh, can you come and meet uh, his, his uncle and other members of the community so uh, we said yes there are about four of us who went to this apartment 
over not too far from here in southeast Portland. And, and what I remember walking the room is all these women who were just crying, 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 and met his uncle. And he asked us what we could do. Uh, we said, well, one of the things we can do is we can have a press event to draw attention to this, and we'll, we'll have a, a rally demonstration. So we did that. We had a press event, and, and, and we got him in touch with an attorney so that he would know what he could safely say and, and what he probably shouldn't say in terms mm-hmm. of what was going to happen going forward with the, with the police investigation. So we did that. And we, we had the rally on the steps of City Hall. We had a couple hundred people came out uh, from the white community, black community, and the Hispanic community to bring attention to what happened and yes. to demand that, that justice be served. We'll hear now from Ingada Barhanu, Mulugeta Sarah's uncle. The speech was recorded at the Mulugeta Sarah Commemoration Conference, sponsored by the Urban League of Portland to honor Mulugeta on the 30th anniversary of his murder and to study the history of anti-black violence in Oregon. Anytime I speak about Mulugeta, I get emotional. Uh, I like to be emotional because he means a lot to me. Here we go. When I arrived in the U.S. from Ethiopia on a student visa in March 1973, I had no plan to remain in the U.S. My plan was to return home immediately after I completed my education. In fact, I was so eager to return home that I received my degree in journalism from Walla Walla College, now Walla Walla University, in three years, in 1976. After I graduated, I was offered a position as director of the Seventh-day Adventist Publishing House in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, where I worked as a translator and editor before I left for the U.S. When I wrote my father to tell him the good news that I was returning home as a big shot, I did not expect his reaction. He told me not to return home at that time. He said it was not safe for me to do so. You see, in 1976, Ethiopia was in the middle of a raging civil war. People were being killed in the streets randomly, especially young, young men. And instead, my father told me to send for my brothers and my nephew to bring them to the U.S., where he thought they would be safer. After a few years of indecision, not knowing when I would re- be able to return home, it dawned on me that Chances for my returning to Ethiopia were getting slimmer and slimmer. I decided to go to graduate school in the U.S. In 1979, I enrolled in the Department of Sociology at Portland State University on this very campus. It was, that, it was at that time I received letters from my nephew, Mulugeta Asrao, and from one of, my bra- one of my brothers letting me know that they had graduated from high school and wanted to come to the U.S. to further their education. By then, I had met and befriended a very kind couple, Clarence and Elsie Tupper, who lived in Goldendale, Washington. They were willing to sponsor Mulugeta and my brother. I sent Mulugeta and my brother IT20s, that's International College Acceptance Letters. Mulugeta completed the process and arrived in Portland in December 1980. I cannot explain. The happiness was we felt both felt when I picked him up at the airport. We had not seen each other since Mulugeta was a small boy. I marveled at how he had grown up into a handsome young man. You see, Mulugeta and I have always had a special bond. He was the second child and the first son of my beloved older sister, Fatanaj Brahanu. She was the person I loved more than anyone else because she cared for my younger siblings and, and me when our young mother died. Unfortunately, she died at a young age too. I felt I was my, it was my turn to help her children now. I was happy to have the opportunity to help Mulugeta. Mulugeta moved in with me in my apartment in Beaverton, 
And he proved to be a very responsible young man. He quickly find a job at first at a fast food restaurant, later at a small Catholic school in Beaverton. He became a favorite of both the students and the staff, the teachers. He was hardworking, caring, kind, and respectful. He also made a circle of friends among the small community of Ethiopians and Americans alike. He quickly was acknowledged as a leader and a peacemaker. He was also an avid soccer player. When I decided to move to California in January 1982 and suggested that he join me in my move, he politely declined. He said he liked it in Portland. He has his friends, his job, his school. He assured me that he could take care of himself. During the following years, Mulugeta and I, my, fa my family, kept in close contact. We would attend relative weddings and other major events together. He would visit my family in California frequently during the holidays, and I would visit him in Portland occasionally. In the process, he and my young daughter established a very special bond during his frequent visit. She just loved his beautiful smile and sweet personality. The last time I saw Mulugeta was during a Labor Day weekend in 1988 a couple of months before, before they were murdered, when we attended a relative's wedding in Walla Walla, Washington. He was very happy and still going to school. Then, then, I received a phone call on that fateful Sunday morning at five o'clock on November 13, 1988. The voice on the other end of the line said that Mulgate was hurt in a fight early that morning. But intuitively, I knew that something had gone terribly wrong because Mulugeta was never a fighter. He, was, he always tried to stop fights. Even when he, has he was murdered, he was not fighting, but he was trying to stop the fight between his friends and the skinheads. This selfless act demonstrates the true nature of Mulugeta's heart, even in the face of danger. My beloved Mulugeta Sarao, lived as a peacemaker, and died as a peacemaker. Thank you. Thanks for listening to episode two of It Did Happen Here. This episode is dedicated to the life of Mulugeta Sarah. Thank you for coming to Earth. Rest in power. This episode, interviews were conducted by Selena Flores, Ender Black, Aaron Yankee, Mike Crenshaw, and Eugene Rashad, and your host was Mike Crenshaw. It Did Happen Here is produced by Mike, Selena, and me, Aaron Yankee. Our website is itdidhappenherepodcast.com, where you can find show notes, links, photos, and more. Thanks to the bands for the music, and thanks to the participants for sharing their stories and experiences. Thank you also to the Marla Davis Fund, KBU Community Radio, and to the rest of our production team. Iki A, Julie Perini, Marat Cackley-Hughes, Mo Baustern, and thank you for listening. <laughs>